Uh, very good evening, and thank you all very much for coming uh, to this, what promises to be a very, very interesting and stimulating discussion about a very topical issue, uh, the new media, the digital media. Uh, my name is Behru Zafar. I work for the BBC World Service. I'm responsible for journalism uh, in the World Service for Middle East and Asia. I'm the moderator. I'm your moderator this evening. And before I introduce the discussion, uh, let me warn you that this whole event is being uh, recorded as live on television and it's going to be archived on the web and it's going to be streamed on at least three uh, websites the addresses of which are here I can pass it on later if you want to watch yourselves so be careful what you say um, just a warning uh, so what we are talking about tonight um, I think probably it's fair to say that it's a cliche talk about information and media revolution um, in the last 10 years. But it is true. It is, it is a cliche because it's so true that the digital revolution in the last decade or so has brought a massive, massive change to the way we live now, um, to the way we consume information, to the way we travel, to the way we do shopping, uh, and to the way we do politics. Um, and also, it's become a very hot uh, talking point. Uh, you would find very many people, ordinary people, talk a lot about how new media is changing politics and changing our lives. Uh, one piece of very interesting statistics that I saw recently is that there are more people using a mobile phone now than they use uh, uh, toothpastes. <laughs> so, um, you know, or a toothbrush. More people uh, use the mobile phone than they use a toothbrush. They brush their teeth. So it's a massive, it's a massive um, phenomenon. So how our lives have changed uh, by the new digital media, by the new digital revolution, is a very, very important topic. One of the most comprehensive, perhaps, studies of how digital media is changing the way we consume information is the project that uh, OSF has supported through the media and the information programs, and it's called Mapping the Digital Media. Uh, it's been going on for the last two, three years, and it is producing a very, very comprehensive report about how uh, media trends are developing and changing in large parts of the world. It, it covers a, a very, very wide geography. The person who's managing this project uh, is Marius Dragomir, Dragomir, who I would introduce as our first speaker. He's going to give you a brief overview of what this research is doing, and then we'll come back to a number of our panelists who have helped produce that report, and we'll get um, some uh, comments from them before we come to uh, questions and answers. Marius. Thank you, Baruz. Um, before uh, I get into that, uh, for those who want to tweet this event, please use the hashtag uh, MDN. Um, mapping digital media. Well, uh, it is, um, I believe, the largest research undertaking that uh, the, uh, the media and the information programs at the Open Society Foundations uh, have ever taken. It's a project uh, covering indeed a large geographical area. Uh, we are examining uh, digital media in 60 countries on all continents. And uh, so far, indeed, we have been working for almost three years on this project. So far, we have um, in various stages of editing almost half of these reports, uh, to be more precise, 27 <laughs> reports. Uh, eight of these reports have been already published, and you can consult them on the websites that I believe are listed on your um, uh, little paper that you found on your chairs. Um, why? I would try to answer the question, why are we doing that? Um, well, we are doing that because <clears throat> digital media are changing indeed uh, massively the ways we consume and access um, news content. Secondly, um, I think digital media are producing many changes um, to the role and position and influence of public service media in society. Um, thirdly, um, digital media um, are affecting 
sometimes uh, in a positive manner, sometimes in a negative manner, affecting, as I said, the, um, the ways people are reacting to media coverage. And equally, digital media um, are affecting the ways journalists are researching their stories and uh, uh, writing their articles. Uh, and equally, uh, digital media um, are affecting uh, the size, the speed, and the forms of cash flow in today's media markets, and the ways media are regulated and legislated. In other words, all these changes are affecting the ways we are getting ourselves informed. So this is mapping digital media, um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from our guests about uh, what's happening in the countries they are either uh, covering as editors or authors of the national reports. Thank you very much. I, uh, there will be a chance later on if you've got questions to ask uh, that Marius and other colleagues who've worked very closely in this project to answer or indeed people are on this panel. I think one of the most important features, aspects of this work is that uh, a lot of people, dozens of people are involved in drawing up, researching and drawing up the reports from various countries. And we've got three people who've been very closely involved in that. Uh, and we're going to hear very briefly again a comment from each of them about something that they, the, the, the trends that they find uh, interesting or emerging from their part of the world. And then we'll open up uh, for discussion and, and, and questions. Uh, so the people, the panel, the, the people on the panel uh, from my left is Fernando Bermejo, who is Associate <coughs> Professor of Communications at uh, University of Rey, uh, Juan Carlos in Spain. And he is the editor of the report on Latin American world. Uh, we have got Abu Bakr Jamai, who's the editor of the Arab, Arab World Report. And uh, Abu Bakr is also the editor of Lacom.com, which is a very highly successful news site in Morocco. And we've got Tom Glazier, who is a, a fellow of Knight Media Policy and works for New America Foundation and is one of the authors of the American Report. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to speak for two, three minutes, as it were, piece to camera, and then, and then we'll ask questions. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to start with uh, Abu Bakr, because kind of, in a way, he represents the most topical countries, the Arab world, and we've heard so much about the impact of media on uh, the revolution that we've seen there. So, Abu Bakr, uh, I suppose, I, I mean, if I wanted to ask a question, I guess you started to work on this project well before these revolutions. Are you, do you have to update it now? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, take a wild guess. <laughs> of course, uh, if you talk to, to our researchers who are working on these countries, they have headaches, actually, because they, they started out this journey on, with, with MDM uh, in, in a different universe. They are, they are a new world right now, and they have to adjust uh, to what's going on. Just to give you one small example, Morocco, which is, which is supposed not to have known a revolution, when the researchers uh, began to work, there were 800,000 uh, Facebook uh, users. Uh, at the end of their research, there were 3 million. Uh, so this is, this is the type of massive change that is just not a statistic. It's more than that. It is, it is uh, illustrative to a profound change in, in, in society. And, and actually, a lot of uh, academics are right now trying to uh, make sense of the relationship between social media and revolutions. We've heard a lot of journalistic stories about social media in the Arab world. We are yet to see some solid academic piece on how exactly social media had played a role into motivating, igniting, organizing uh, this, uh, uh, these revolutions. There is, I think, one uh, piece of, of research from the University of Washington which showed that there was a linkage between uh, social media and the activities uh, on, so, on social media and, and, and revolutions. But the account on as to how it exactly played out is not clear yet. And I believe a lot of political scientists and media experts will, will, will work on these uh, issues for, for a, a very long time. But I don't, th I, 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 I don't think there is a doubt that uh, uh, social media and internet has empowered people to, uh, to move. You know, one of the um, one of the, the big, solid findings in political science is that you cannot predict a revolution. 
And uh, one of the explanation is because that type of information in authoritarian societies is kept secret, is private. They call it, we call it private. So you cannot fathom what people are thinking. So you can surmise what they might do, revolt or not. So maybe, and this is a very personal uh, uh, and um, adventurous conjecture, maybe uh, that social media had played a role of allowing people to know a little bit of what was going on in their neighborhood, that maybe their neighbor is thinking likewise, that, that they, they really don't like Ben Ali, they really don't like Mubarak. And, and secondly, it, 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 that we know a little bit more about, it played a role into organizing people. There was, for example, in this study from the University of Washington, we, we, we see uh, a, a spike in, 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 in tweets about you know, what will happen in Tahrir Square, and then it happens in Tahrir Square. So obviously, there is communication going on there. So uh, to, to, to sum what I have to say is actually we are at the very early stages of, of how exactly internet, social media had played a role into, into, into this revolution. I mean, one big question is that what's your sense? Is this just an urban thing? But many people may argue that yes, uh, I can see this playing a very big role in, 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 in Cairo, for instance, among the young university students. But somehow a, 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 an Egyptian farmer how is social media kind of reaching him, or directly or indirectly? I think it's safe to say that it is an urban thing. Uh, it, it is definitely an urban thing. But uh, you know, the revolution when they happened outside the big cities happened in small cities, but yet cities, uh, small urban centers. Uh, so I think that urbanization is part of the story somehow in in in, in what happened in the in the Arab world and the rate of urbanization. Uh, is certainly in the mix. It, it is certainly out there in this equation that might explain what happened uh, recently in the Arab world. Okay, we'll come back to this question, I'm sure. Okay, let's move on to Tom Glazier, who's um, who's one of the authors of the American Report. Um, what are the kinds of conclusions you are beginning to draw from from your your work? Well, thankfully, we haven't faced quite the upheaval <laughs> that our our backer has. Um, there's but there's still something different going on. There is still uh, a significant change. The barriers to entry, uh, the ability to produce content is open to many, if not everyone, who has a connection and who can afford a connection, who has the skills for, of, a connect, of a broadband connection. There's something magical about this openness um, of the internet. Um, the flip side is that the media economic f the flows of of money around uh, media companies, despite us often spending more money on media and communications, um, and spending more time looking at news, those of us who look at news, there's less money going to, to journalism. Uh, there's less money going to produce uh, facts that will hold the powerful to account. And, and it's this paradox of more content and less um, uh, fewer journalists, uh, by some estimates, uh, somewhere between 800 million and 1.3 billion uh, dollars a year in uh, annual editorial salaries have been lost over the last few years. And that's a, a huge sum. And much as I may admire my own tweets, T. Glazier, uh, um, you, you've got to really draw, um, uh, it's difficult to, you know, uh, I don't try and compare my tweets to Jill Abramson's tweets or um, other senior journalists who really have worked in the trenches um, and are day-to-day -day reporting on news. And I think we have to uh, really take a hard look at what's happened. It hasn't happened in a vacuum. There are policies uh, in the US that have created some wonderful things, but have also created significant challenges uh, for us as a, a democracy with the media we've got now. I'll just leave it at that for now. There's plenty more to be said. I think coming to the question of policy, I think I can imagine in a country which is, has got an authoritarian regime trying to um, filter the internet, etc. So policy does matter in a way. In a way, I mean, the naive question is that in a country like America, you know, free information, people can produce whatever they like, people can read whatever they like. What's the need for policy? What's the need for media policy? That's a, a great question. I, the, it seems, well, this, isn't this great, can we just go home? Um, but it, it hasn't happened for, for no uh, reason. There are ownership limits on uh, the number of 
radio or TV station someone can own in a market or own over, around across the country. Um, spectrum key for distributing an increasingly mobile environment is allocated on a basis and has been allocated uh, a, on different bases over time. It, uh, its allocation of uh, spec the, the allocation of the spectrum by the FCC to non-commercial radio and television stations in the 50s and 60s um, created a, a set of uh, of institutions that have really served us quite well in many ways. Now maybe they should be doing more, uh, but there there's something quite special about uh, the way spectrum is allocated. Ownership is uh, is limited or constrained that produces a certain media system that will serve us for better or for worse. Okay, thanks very much. Let's move on to Fernando, uh, perspective from uh, Latin American world. Um, well, f f first of all, I, I, I guess if you want to make a summary of what the situation of digital media um, in a region like Latin America is, um, I think at first you need to take a couple of steps back. One, one is uh, the one that I had to do when I started working in this project, which is what will we mean by digitization and digital media. Um, and, and I realized that, that even though we all seem to understand what it is, when we actually have to be precise about it, it's much more complicated than it seems. Um, and, and I realize that actually when we talk about digital media, we're talking about many different things. Yeah, the digitization is a very kind of, yeah, technical term that can be applied in many fields. And so when we're talking about it, we, we're talking on the one hand about how mass media are moving into the digital realm and talking about television, and talking about radio, I'm talking about the print press. Um, and then on the other hand, you can think of digital media as basically what goes on on the internet. Um, which is digital, it's kind of native uh, digital. Um, and so those two waves seem to be colliding. And I think what we're witnessing right now is that moment of flux in which those two things are happening at the same time. And we're creating, we're seeing a new space for communication and media um, evolving and, and being born. Um, on the other hand, um, there is also an issue of, of regional trends. Um, uh, Latin America is a pretty big area, uh, geographic area. And so there are many differences between, let's say, countries in Central America like Nicaragua or Guatemala and what goes on in Brazil or Argentina or Colombia. So there are many different um, details that get lost when we just do a general summary. So having said that, um, um, what, what I perceive as emerging is, uh, on the one hand, um, the, the media, the traditional media, are slowly moving into the digital realm. The, the, um, the, there is a process of transition from analog to digital television happening in almost every country. Um, but it's still going to take about a decade for that process to finish. Um, and so there's still the first few steps, so it's difficult to tell how that's going to play out. Um, in terms of the internet, on the other hand, you can see a growing um, um, numbers of users and penetration of the internet in basically all these countries. Very different as well. That some countries have uh, very high internet penetration, some others are still um, pretty low. Um, but but the, the use of, for instance, social networks is uh, huge among the people who are connected, which uh, of course then there we have to look at differences in terms of digital divides and rural versus urban areas and, and educated versus uneducated people. But, but I would say that um, in these two ways that I was describing at the beginning, probably the one that comes from the internet, is, it's, it's coming with more force than the one that um, is moving from analog mass media into digital mass media. Mm -hmm. How about as a kind of social revolution or accountability phenomena in countries which are less democratic than others? Is it seen, like for instance, increasingly in the Arab world or or countries where there is a you know struggle for democracy? Is it seen the social media and 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 the internet as a tool which can be used for that? You you can see that it's it's being used. Um, however, it's still. Um, in, in terms of activism, um, it's still a, a very 
uh, a small number of people who are doing that and the repercussions um, are not as broadly felt as, as some might wish or think it, it, it does. Good. Thanks very much. Okay, let's open up to questions and, and, and comments and kind of if, and particularly if, you, if you've got direct experience of uh, media in any of the countries that we've discussed or indeed countries that we haven't discussed, uh, a comment or insight that you've got to share will be very, very useful. And can I ask you please also when, when you want to speak, say who you are and what organization you represent. Uh, microphone there. Hello, Daud Kutta from Community Media Network in Amman, Jordan, covering some Middle East countries. Um, the question to Abu Bakr, but also to the other panelists. The uh, fact of the uh, government control of most of the media in the Arab countries, radio and television almost 100% controlled by government, most of the newspapers are partially or fully controlled by governments. Did that uh, trigger, because of the availability of social media because of the globalization basically invited many countries wanted to be involved in globalization for exchanging goods and as a result they also had to they were forced to exchange information so was there a relationship between the fact that media was very repressive in the in sense of ownership and platforms and at the same time some of the same countries were basically encouraging globalization for economic reasons and they got stuck also with the information globalization that basically brought them down. So can you talk about that relationship between media repression, globalization, and, and the information exchange? Uh, it's clearly uh, one of the contradictions of, of uh, pro-market authoritarian systems where you adhere and it's part of your marketing campaign toward the West that you adhere to, to, to pro-market policies, but at the same time, you are using authoritarian uh, uh, policies toward your, your, your own people. I think one of the interesting cases to illustrate this point is what happened in Egypt when at some point, I think Mubarak shut down internet completely, uh, by, but by the same gesture, he killed off a whole industry of, um, sub I don't remember the name, the, um, the call centers uh, industry because they were using internet. So by trying to quell uh, the revolution, he was wiping out the whole uh, industry, which was, which was very important for, uh, for Egypt. So definitely, yes, uh, w w here you, you just put your finger on this, this very, very uh, central contradiction in, in, in how they deal and how globalization is not only a dirty word. I mean, it can be something positive, and in this, in this very case, it, it certainly played, uh, played a role. And it's a reputational thing as well. Uh, for Morocco, for example, one of the good things, one of the positive aspects of, uh, of, of uh, Morocco vis-a-vis -vis media and internet is that internet has been free almost 100%. We hear and there are some censorship towards Islamist uh, websites, uh, pro-Sahrawi websites, etc. But, but by and large, compared to the rest of the Arab world, it has, been, it has been free. And one of the major reasons, it's not that the regime is philosophically, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, completely in um, uh, liking this, this, this freedom of speech, etc. But because it's part of how Morocco has to be perceived uh, in, 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 in general. Uh, and it, it, it led to, uh, to the uh, creation of a public space that has been used and is being used by the pro-democracy uh, pro uh, activists. So another, on another scale, you can, you can, you can version that. Uh, Tunisia, it's, it's interesting to see how the Ben Ali's regime was so adamant in organizing the, the ITU summit, the telecommunication summit a few years ago, with, with the huge row that, that happened. Well, you can, you can look at it from the angle of the regime, uh, you know, t for the regime to be, to be so, uh, put so much energy into being perceived as being pro-freedom of, uh, uh, freedom of speech and, and, free and, and, and technologically advanced by, by hosting this, the summit in itself shows the, uh, the, this, this, this contradiction uh, in, their, in their behavior. Questions? The back then? <coughs> ah, right, okay. You next. My name is Colin Sam from Nigeria, currently visiting scholar at the Institute for the Study of Human Rights, Columbia University. Uh, my question is about uh, looking at what the moderators thought about the urban phenomena. 
you know, I'm a little bit curious about the role of media, especially in the Arab Revolution. If you consider it as an urban <coughs> phenomenon, will it be that the media played a role, you know, in more like encouraging the revolution? Why it might not have been the majority of the people? If you consider that the people in the rural area had no access to media and they were not part of it, will it not be fair to say that the media more like encouraged the revolution without actually you know, being a true representative of the various country. And then my second comment is that being from Nigeria and Sub-Saharan Africa, I could have been more interested in seeing maybe a report on the media in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Okay. What's your own experience of changes in the media in Africa? And, and particularly, I mean, not necessarily media in, a, in, a, in the very traditional sense, but this advent of, for instance, the importance of, of mobile phones, for instance. Uh, definitely, in Nigeria, there's been a tremendous growth in the role of mobile phone and the media. But again, it's more an elitist thing. So, you know, if you consider it as an elitist thing, maybe because I'm an activist, if you consider it as an elitist thing, so you cannot say precisely that it reflects the majority thought. You know, I go to the villages, I work in the communities. Majority of those in the community have a cell phone just to communicate. They don't use the Facebook, they don't use Twitter, they don't use all those fancy stuff. So it's only the elite and the educated that use those things to communicate. And that can be actually be a tool for manipulation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Anne Nelson, I teach at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, and I have a few of my students here, I'm glad to say. Um, Tom Glazier, you and I have been corresponding recently about some movement in the spectrum assignment, or at least the, the proposals to allocate more of the spectrum to first responders and to help um, public service organizations in general have more access. Uh, it seems to be a fairly technical area, and I was wondering if you could update us and tell us what's happening with that discussion. It is an incredibly technical area. <laughs> um, so I'll just sort of unpack it a little and, and give a general update. Um, the, there is, uh, as we know in the, in the US, uh, some questions around the federal deficit. Um, one of the solutions to solving that is to sell spectrum for the highest value, uh, to uh, basically repurpose spectrum and allocate unallocated spectrum to different purposes. So there, there are currently a number of different ways this can happen. Um, you can take, uh, you can encourage the broadcasters to give up some spectrum, perhaps for, uh, if you sell it for a dollar, they get 20 cents and they give it up for 20 cents and the, the treasury gets 80. Um, you can take currently unallocated spectrum and sell it uh, in the same way, and the treasury gets $100 uh, a dollar for every dollar it's sold for. Or you can take unallocate, unallocated spectrum and allocate it for different uses. And there, is, there are several proposals for those different uses. One, uh, <coughs> driven quite uh, strongly by uh, the, the public safety lobby for the allocation of unallocated spectrum, uh, and some energized uh, by the, uh, the anniversary of 9-11, uh, that really we need to get on this because we don't want to solve this problem of uh, first responders being able to speak to each other. And the other is allocating that spectrum to unlicensed uses. Uh, and that would be a sort of Wi-Fi on steroids. So we think of Wi-Fi at home that goes maybe goes through one wall or two, and it's kind of useful. And we've all really many of us have deployed it in in our houses. Well, imagine if you could uh, take a, a much better band of, of radio spectrum that actually goes not yards but miles. Uh, and imagine if that was allocated on a opportunistic or unlicensed basis that everyone got there, they could use it when they needed it. We designed devices that used it, how much innovation uh, that, could, that could yield. And really what's going on in Congress uh, is a, a battle between the forces <laughs> who want as much money for the Treasury as possible, bar nothing, uh, a group who wants some spectrum allocated for public safety, uh, dedicated public safety, and then a group uh, who uh, 
are supportive of unlicensed spectrum. Um, I personally am very interested in the unlicensed opportunity because I think it will spur incredible innovation and connectivity and lower our cost uh, for connectivity. But I, and I'm really hoping for some sort of balanced outcome. Um, as with many things in Congress these days, I'm not optimistic. Okay. So. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. Do you have any work inside of Cuba? And if you do, I would like to know what the young people in Cuba have access to. Um, unfortunately, that's, uh, Cuba is not one of the, um, the countries that uh, it's being covered in the Latin American region. Um, we have uh, Mexico, which is a uh, report that is already finished and published. Um, uh, Guatemala, Nicaragua, uh, Colombia, Peru, Chile, Argentina, um, and Brazil, and Uruguay, uh, but uh, not in Cuba, unfortunately. So, uh, I mean, I couldn't speak beyond what I know from reading uh, the news about what goes on in Cuba, about what really is happening there in terms of access um, to to media or the internet. I, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't be able to to specify any information that you probably don't have already. So. True tradition of new media. Is there anyone in the audience who knows more about it? <laughs> about Cuba, what's going on there? OK. I have yeah, do you, do you have any more information about Cuba? I've, I've written some about it. Would you mind kind of telling us? Which? Um, yeah, what you have is this incredible hacker culture going on in Cuba. Uh, Hugo Chavez just has been building a fiber optic cable to Cuba, which is going to be multiplying the bandwidth many times over. And so everybody's saying, how do political in leaders who incline towards censorship think they're going to in control this expansion of content? Because they don't have, they're not like the Chinese, where they have tens of thousands of censors sitting ready to, to go after it. So you're going to have this explosion of, of access, you've got uh, telecentros, which have been designed in Brazil, but are being built out rapidly in Venezuela and now in Cuba, that give community access. So school children get them during the day, <coughs> community people get access to the internet after school hours. Um, there's government vigilance, there's a very lively blogging culture, Yoni Sanchez has become an international mm -hmm. rock star, and she builds her computers pretty much out of parts that have been thrown in the garbage partly because of our embargo, which means that we can't get advanced equipment to the people who are pressing for democracy in Cuba. So there we are, back to policy. Thank you very much. Thanks. The lady here, the gentleman at the back there. Um, my name is Atili. I'm also from, uh, I'm also from Columbia, um, Columbia <laughs> University. Um, my question to uh, Sir Abu, um, you said about from eight 800,000 to 3 million, right, Facebook. Like, uh, we're talking about how the new media has influenced or positively. Um, are there also, out of the 3 million, were there a few thousands who were pro-government, pro you know? Because um, I'm a journalist, but I, I also know that in, in India, I'm, I come from Northeast, uh, I'm from Nagaland, hundreds of fake identities in the name of counterinsurgency, they you know, they suppress movements, they influence the youth, you know, so it's like, I just wonder from the... Okay, Iraq let's students. get, if, thank you very much. Let's get one or two more questions in and then we'll try and answer them. The lady in the front. Uh. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Lydia, I'm from Uganda. I work with the Women Integrated Initiative for Development, but I'm here as a visiting scholar at Columbia University. My question is, uh, it's going to be like an observation, but also a question is, uh, how will you be able to verify that the same people who are maybe uh, signing up for Twitter, Facebook, and the same people who are using uh, the TVs and televisions are different people? Because it could be the same people, but they are just skipping to change. Uh, and then the other one is, what is your finding on the role of women in influencing digital revolution, or in the use or access, I don't know, something like that. Okay, one more question at the back there, the lady there, yeah. Oh. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Elvis Mbembe. I'm from Rwanda. 
and I'm one of the 14 advocates participating to the Human Rights Advocate Program at Columbia University. Uh, I've noticed that media is really a powerful instrument. Uh, this cannot be proved today because we know what happened in the Arab world. But this is a positive change. But it can also contribute in a negative change. Those who followed the 1994 genocide in Rwanda remember what was the role of the, uh, the sadly famous Radio Tele de Mil Colin. At that time, they tried to find ways to interfere with their broadcast. At that time, I think also it could be done because only uh, we did not yet have digitalized media as today. But today, with the proliferation of digital media, such as internet, mobile phones, uh, iPad, and so on, I'm wondering how we can still control such issues, media, especially when it's going at the bad side. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's try and do you want to f first talk about how were we sure that, uh, let's say, that the 800, the, the new people who are using the, um, the, net, the, face, um, the social network in Morocco are not necessarily, um, uh, the question was that, were they also, did they also include government supporters, mm -hmm. for instance, or were they all kind of opposition? You have two types of government supporters. You have those who are paid to be government supporters and those who are ideologically convinced by the government or the regime uh, position. That's, that's a better word. And, and, and the problem is, is, is with the first kind, not the second one. The second one, the second one is absolutely, uh, their presence is absolutely legitimate in the agora, in the, in the public space. We think uh, that in Morocco, we had some people who, who were, uh, who were employed by the government to uh, to uh, to be present in the in the, uh, in the on the internet on Facebook on, on Twitter and to hound people who are who were uh, who were advocating uh, democratization in the country. Now, from from my personal experience, if if they were paid to do it, the few I thought were paid to do it were were not very astute because it suffice to look at their profile on Facebook, which is very easy to do. Uh, for example, you find uh, there was one who was a Harvard graduate with five, uh, with four friends. You know, for example, that was very, very unlikely. A Moroccan Harvard graduate with four friends, that was not <laughs> very plausible. So that kind of things. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the conversation that took place ended up being a, a, a constructive one in the sense that it was not polluted enough to become meaningless. And that's, that's, that's a very uh, positive outcome, I believe, of, of, of this explosion of uh, internet usage and social media usage in, in particular. I know that in Tunisia, during the Ben Ali's uh, phase, that obviously, this is a story that has been well reported on. Uh, social media have been used, the internet, uh, as the traditional media has been completely domesticated. The government has put a lot of resources into trying to control social media as well by, by paying people uh, to, uh, to, to go on the internet and go after uh, democratic activists. This is to say that this is a double-edged sword, that this is a medium, which means that it can be used by the government. Uh, the other thing about internet is everything is traceable, uh, technically speaking. So if you are, as a, as a state, uh, rich enough, and generally you're richer than, than your opponents, you can always hire some some Western company that will give you the technological tools to, to trace back whatever is going on uh, on your blogosphere, on your Twittersphere, on your, uh, on, your, on your Facebook. So this is a real challenge. Uh, so it is a double-edged sword, and, uh, and, and, and it seems that, that, that the demo democracy activists are a little bit ahead of the, of the curve uh, on, on this one. Uh, besides, again, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't think, you know, the, the way I'm talking about this uh, might lead uh, us to think that, that social media were, were, were a, a center stage into, into the revolution. I don't, again, let me just repeat that. We did not sort out the real weight of each phenomena, urbanization, social media, demographic bulge. All of these things are still being worked out in the, in the mix that led to, 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 to the revolution. And it's, it's, it's premature. 
uh, to say that, that social media were, 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 were central. They played a role. We don't know yet what type of role and, and to what extent they have, uh, they have contributed to the revolution. OK, the other three kind of points were fairly general. The, can it be a force for evil as well? Can it help the force, uh, forces of evil? Which I guess uh, Abu Bakr uh, replied to some extent, but we'll go back to the others as well. But also the, the involvement of women, and then also how can we differentiate between users of different medium? Who wants to go have a go at it? Uh, Turn on the well, in, in terms of the, um, the evil uses of, of the media, I guess, uh, as every human tool can be used for many different purposes, what, what you would hope is that by uh, promoting um, access and diversity in the production and distribution of media, um, those evil uses will be countered by other more positive ones. So I guess that's, that's my best answer at that. Um, in terms of, of the issue of um, how do you know who is using what and where, um, that that would lead us in a very um, kind of tangent direction, which is also relevant, which is the issue of how do you know what goes on online? And what are the tools that we have to know what goes on online? And who has access to that information? And that's a very complicated um, situation, because um, we tend to do comparisons between media and, say, for instance, um, oh, 40% uh, of newspaper readers read the New York Times, but 80% of uh, online users use Google. So uh, the internet is actually more concentrated than the print press. Um, actually, beyond or below the level of Google go on so many things that are so different from what goes on behind or below the name of a newspaper. Um, is so much more complex what is behind a URL than what is behind a newspaper name um, that uh, it's difficult to make those kinds of comparisons. And so if you want to go with specifically what goes on within a particular website, then we have the issue of access to data. The data is precious, as we all know. It's a wonderful commodity. That's what drives the online economy. And so you're not going to be able to get the data from the companies that own that data. Um, and there are all these different platforms, so to speak, that own a lot of data about online behavior. Um, none of them, of course, want to share that data with other platforms and let alone with researchers, because that's their goal. That's how they make money. So. OK. And any, any kind of insights about the, yeah, so the I'll, I'll the respond a little bit. Women as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and respond to as many points as I can. I started off with the internet is liberty and openness. And uh, there's a paradox of the potential for control and what Facebook can, if, if the Stasi still existed now, Facebook would tell it all that it, uh, tell them all that it, they ever dreamed of. Um, and, and you get to some really serious questions of uh, how can you, get out of that issue? Because can you regulate your way out of the issue? Or is ultimately, if that data exists, someone's always always going to be able to get hold of it? So then you start getting into questions of design and, and questions of n not storing things in centralized databases or storing them in, in a distributed manner, encrypted on your own data stick. Uh, and these are the, the sort of question, the questions we have to, we're going to have to struggle with. And I, I, I'll respond to the Rwanda, the gentleman from Rwanda. Um, I, I got into this business in a way by looking at uh, the genocide in Rwanda and media, and I always reflect on uh, that. The community media here is a soft, fluffy word in, in the US. It's a nice thing. We all want more of it. Uh, and the low power radio stations that uh, uh, there was a re earlier this year, there was an act called the Local Community Radio Act, which was uh, signed by President Obama, which is going to open up more community radio stations. It's, a, it's going to be a, a very good thing and very positive because of the ecosystem in which those stations exist in. Uh, for Rwanda, it w was not. It, it, they were tools of the genocidaires and it, terribly problematic. And, and we really need to retool our policy making apparatus for this converged world of, of digital data and, and consider what 
we do. And just to reiterate a little bit on the questions of anonymity and verification, um, the online economy, as Fernando mentioned, depends on on that. Uh, yet the questions of justice in a world with total surveillance, I think just us sitting out there and how we get, how we address them both in policy and design are, have yet to be uh, resolved. So. Okay, any insights, any kind of interesting trends about the involvement of women? I don't know, Marius, as somebody who's, you know, okay, nothing, any, no, no, no particular the, comment on that. The one uh, thing I have heard about um, in the UK, and this may be incorrect, the use of the sort of mommy, moms network in the Millie Dowler response to uh, the hacking mm. uh, for raw, um, that I think the shadow of that uh, latent group of uh, connected people was, you know, known and recognized by politicians. I think that's a good sort of hint or segue for, for a video that we've got about, about uh, the, the, the hacking saga and how, if you like, the over-concentration of media control uh, can damage and, you know, what effect it can have on 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 uh, relationship between media and and uh, politics. I think we've got two video comments, very brief, two minutes each. One from UK by Des Friedman, who's the author of the UK report, and he's particularly commenting about the the News International uh, scandal. I think we'll play the the video in a minute, and we'll come back to the question. I think the phone hacking saga brought to the attention of millions and millions of people in the UK what the impact can be of concentrated media power, that an organisation like News Corporation can have its fingers in so many puddings, have so much influence, be able to draw on friends in the police and in government uh, in a very unhealthy way for democracy. Now, that in itself did not cause the phone hacking scandal, did not cause the behaviour that appalled so many millions of people. That is the result of another, I would say, systemic and structural um, set of circumstances where journalists are forced to work harder across more platforms um, to try and get beat their competition. And that arises from the kind of media market that we're seeing uh, of enormous competition and enormous pressure. And I think the problem is where you have that kind of pressure, that kind of competition, together with the huge um, and very unaccountable institutions, groups like News Corporation, uh, it's, it's, it can be catastrophic both for journalism and for democracy. And so what we need now out of the phone hacking saga is a serious debate about what kind of ownership structures would be best. How can we best use this opportunity, not just to try, try and make sure that those kind of unethical journalistic practices go away, but to look for systems of regulation, structures of ownership that will present a much more open, inclusive, representative media system. So it's a very complicated situation where you have journalistic debates, you have all sorts of unhealthy political um, relationships accrued from this concentrated power, um, epitomized by News Corporation. And we have to see this as a real opportunity to start to deal with questions of ownership concentration. So I think you have to be an optimist in this um, set of circumstances to think this is the one chance we're, we're going to have uh, for some years to tackle one of the most serious problems that we all face in, in Britain today. Thanks very much. I think uh, the question which kind of I have about this is that uh, is this, you know, over concentration of power or control, is it a byproduct of the new media environment? Is competition, as he says, harming, if you like, public interest, harming public interest journalism? Or, 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 or you know, what we've seen, the phone hacking scandal is really something which is uh, outside the environment itself. I mean, that's the key question. In other words, can we all, can we lump it all together? I wonder whether anybody would like to comment on that. I'll, I'll take Do you want to have a go, Tom? Yeah, I, the phone hacking saga in, in, in England is just quite simply represents an event you don't want to have happen. <laughs> you, you don't want to get to that point. Um, 
And for me, it just reinforces the the need for uh, media ownership concentration and concentration uh, rules and regulations to be maintained. And I, to rewi rewind to history of the 2003, there was a rare moment of bipartisanship, really, um, when the FCC uh, voted to massively deregulate media ownership and found itself facing furore from the left and the right and a voting Congress which basically rolled back some of the media ownership relaxation limits in 2003. And that was really quite a, uh, a, a tremendous sort of moment of uh, for the media reform movement. Uh, and you'd like to think it would still happen today that the uh, outcome of a lot of that media deregulation is actually still in the courts and is going to come back and bite us fairly soon. Um, I've got to say that I thank God it happened over there because maybe it'll stop us from having it happen over here and we'll maintain the, these limits. Uh, so that's my really sort of impassioned hope. Are there, yep. Yeah. Um, you asked whether we think that has something to do with the digital media. Um, I think it doesn't, however, um, we shouldn't think that um, the online world is, is kind of uh, free from issues like the ones being discussed here. Um, they, and I wonder also whether we have the, the tools, not just legal, but even intellectual at this moment to understand uh, the dangers of concentration uh, in the online realm. And, and I'm saying this because we're witnessing an increasing relevance of a few online platforms that control um, search and social networks and video online. Um, and all these platforms, um, they have at least two things that, that make them tend towards monopolies. And, and one of them is that they all seem to learn from their own activity. They're constantly learning. Like a search engine gets better the more it's being used. So the more it's being used, the better it is, so the more people want to use it. Um, and also you have the, the network effect, which is the more people who are in my network, the more interest in the network is, so the more people join the network. So that creates these kind of like niche platforms for different online activities, which, which in the end seem to be um, unaccountable in, in certain levels about their behavior because they're the, they don't have competitors, basically. Um, so, to go back to the question, no, this has, I think, ha nothing to do with digital media. However, we shouldn't lose sight of possible similar issues taking place in the online realm. Thanks. Yeah, I Do would... you want to add it? Well, I, um, uh, I, well, I can, I can see why uh, concentration has led to, or, or some might think that concentration had led to, to, this, to this accident. But, but my question would be, was it an accident waiting to happen, a catastrophe waiting to happen, or, uh, uh, or is, it, is, it, is it just by chance or by you know, conjunction of, of um, uh, different things that, that led to it? Because if you believe in the first uh, story, then it's systemic and then you must do something about it. Uh, I'm, I'm not totally convinced that it's that it's systemic. What is extremely troubling for someone like me coming from where I come from, is the uh, is the uh, the behavior of the police, the behavior of the politicians. Uh, that was that, that that was something extremely uh, extremely shocking. That 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 all these politicians were cuddling Murdoch. All these police people were were, were completely in cahoot with this with this rogue journalist to expose simple citizens' lives, and th that's, that's something extremely troubling. And again, where does it come from? Is it systemic? The, is it something inbuilt in the system that led to this, and then we need to religiously to regulate? I, I, I don't know. The increasing this is power a very naive question. Media, so. I, yeah. I, think, but I think there's some interesting just challenge, design challenges. The internet was designed around open standards. Um, the Facebook is not. Uh, AP, uh, you get application an API, basically access into data on terms that Facebook provides you to their very valuable uh, set of data. Um, this, you, we can make all make choices, both as individuals, as 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 system designers, or as legal policymakers around 
the the future, the online digital future that we have. And I think I'll echo Fernanda's point. We haven't yet got the people with this, the right set of skills to really understand the challenges in the way they need to be understood and to work our way out of that. Um, it's a work in progress, and I want to hope that some, there are some people in this room who want to be part of that. OK, let's go back to some questions. Yes, at the back there. Sorry, we've made things long. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Durand. I work uh, at the Alliance of Civilizations, the United Nations yeah. Alliance of Civilizations. Can you hear me? Sorry. So I repeat. Uh, my name is Stephanie Durand. I work uh, in the media program of the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. For those who don't know what it is, it's a special project of the Secretary General launched in 2007 to uh, address uh, intercultural tensions between the West and the so-called Muslim world. Um, we actually just launched, uh, talking about experience and activities in um, some of the regions of interest tonight, we just launched a uh, online training yesterday together with the New York Times, including involving uh, American, French, but also Tunisian and Egyptian journalists uh, on the topic covering elections, um, because we think it's a crucial topic, not only because it's a time for election for Tunisia and Egypt in the coming weeks, but also because um, uh, obviously there's the issue of how to cover elections in regimes that were not used to cover election democratically. So my question is to uh, Abou uh, Kar, and I'm pleased to meet you in person after talking to you over, over the phone. Um, how do you see um, the challenges in particular in Morocco, where you're from, but also in Tunisia for websites like yours, Lacom, but also Nawat in Tunisia? How do you see the issue of ethics uh, for social media, for bloggers, uh, of course, for important uh, um, um, you know, moments like elections, but more generally with this new generation of um, online presence, how will ethics would be handled? How will training also in general be handled for people who don't necessarily have a traditional training in journalism? Thanks very much. Let's have a few more questions there. There at the back, the gentleman. <coughs> Hello, I'm Guy Berger from South Africa. And I did the South African study for this uh, OSI. And I, I came across two things that might be of interest to people here. The one is it was extremely difficult to get an understanding of internet access in South Africa. For example, the ITU data gave a certain statistic which was based on them surveying people, did you use the internet once in the past year? Which is just a crazy question. And it also then what is the internet? And what I found is that lots of people use the internet on their cell phones. They don't know they use the internet. So it turns out that most people using fixed line internet use it at their workplace, which has got implications for how they use it and what they can use it for. Uh, those people use, who have internet access on their cell phones on 3G don't have necessarily broadband on that 3G. Uh, second of all, the, the, the size of the screen limits what they can do and the bandwidth and the cost limits whether they can do uh, video or, or heavy density stuff on their, on their phone. So I think these are, these are quite important developments because one throws around internet access as if it was a glib thing that's fairly easy to, to kind of measure. But actually, it's really complex in terms of what it really means. <coughs> what, I, what I found in South Africa is that actually the killer application with cell phones is not internet access. It's still SMS, which is a one-to-one -one medium. And I suspect, even in Tahir Square, probably SMS played a greater role than social media. But you know, that's, that's, that's a, that I'd be interested to hear. The other thing that uh, I, I looked at was digital television. And the transition from analog to digital television raises the huge question, well, if you've got this, this digital bandwidth for TV, what's going to go on it? And even in a rich, relatively rich country like South Africa, there is not the business model to put indigenous content or local content in, in that digital space. So either there's going to be a load of rubbish uh, imported um, from elsewhere, such as televangelism that comes from this country trying to squeeze local citizens for donations, or, or there's another alternative, and this I think becomes very important, whether the, that bandwidth can also be used for download of internet content that's high bandwidth. So in other words, whether you can have a hybrid system and the hybrid system then points to the set-top box being the actual 
be, being the critical key potential for, for convergence, whereby people can uplink through a cell phone modem linked to their set-top box and download coming through the, the broadcast stream. So that's one of the debates that's taking place in policy circles in South Africa at the moment. Except that the broadcasters don't like that because they're still stuck in the model of broadcasting we deliver to you. And of course, once you give people the technology through a set-top box whereby they can begin to actually choose what they want and where you as a broadcaster have to become an ISP, it changes your paradigm. So those are some of the obstacles to, to digitization of media mm -hmm. in South Africa. Thanks very much. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Um, I'm Haley Cohen, and I worked as a fact checker at the New America Foundation this summer, and I'm going um, on a year-long fellowship to Yale to study the new media law in Argentina, but I haven't gone yet, so do not asked me any questions about that yet. Um, but to speak to Tom's point about, um, you talked about the salary cuts um, in journalism, and obviously that translates to actual positions being cut, reporters being cut from beats, um, and I was wondering if any of you had any insights on um, how to fill those reporting gaps and if those reporting gaps are to be filled with um, less expensive operators, so citizen journalism um, or things along those lines, uh, how do we keep more, less expensive um, kind of systems accountable to the facts? And I think as a former fact checker, I'm especially interested in that just in terms of if you don't have the money to employ editors and fact checkers, how do you make sure that what's being reported is accurate? Okay, thanks very much. And one last, for this round, I meant not last, <laughs> as in last. Um, I'm Gwyneth Henderson. Um, I've been in journalism and media for a very long time. Um, I just want to go back, if I may, to the UK thing for a minute. Um, Social media had nothing at all to do with the phone hacking thing. The phone hacking started long before, um, and it goes back to the 90s, actually. But I think there's something else very important about it. We forget this, why did the phone hacking come out in the end? It's not systemic. It came out because of journalism. It came out because of incredibly good journalism over a number of years, under enormous pressure, supported by the private eyes and everything else. And of course, I'm talking about The Guardian. And I wonder if you know, we're talking a lot about technical things. We're talking a lot about you know, whether we maybe talk a little bit, ask you to address the questions of content and the impact on the content, and therefore the agendas and the subjects of discourse that are actually happening within nation or, or globally. Because that's the thing that, truthfully, most concerns me. I don't much care what the platform sure. is, but actually what are people actually getting yep. and being able to assess, being able to examine, being able to use. Um, because Mumsnet's first actually really important thing was during the election and nothing to do with phone hacking. Okay. Thanks very much. I mean your question I guess is very much related to your question as well. You know, how do you how do you how do you cover the reporting gaps or you know cutting off the salaries, etc. Or, or 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 a bigger question, is the digital media helping journalism, helping reporting, helping understanding? I think that's one question. And then second question, which is sort of related, how 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 what are the ethical challenges, particularly in the Arab world? Let's let's concentrate on the first question first. Who do you want? Yep. Do you want to? Do you want to? Uh, no, actually, I'm just. Um, I was thinking that Abu Bakr probably has yeah, a. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the ethical question it, first? So. Fine. Fair enough. Yes. Uh, you mentioned Nawet. Nawet is a, is a news website, a Tunisian news website, doing a fantastic work. And you mentioned Lekum, which is trying to do the same. And in fact, this is an answer to this ethical uh, question. Because if you think about the strategy of these two news websites, they're trying to build a brand. And if you want to try to build a brand, well, you should be ethically sound. And in fact, it answers uh, one of the big problems with, 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 with this new internet era, is that information is scattered all over the place. That's one. And secondly, there is a dearth of ways to make sense of this information, to render it intelligible, to, to, to connect the dots. So when we castigate editorialism and news analysis, actually we do need editorialism and news analysis to make sense of, of this vast amount of information we are bombarded with. Um, so uh, what's going on, and, and it's very hard because no one has come up, we were talking about 
Uh, I was talking to Maris before uh, about the, the US report, the MDM US report, and my question was, was simple. Did they find a business model? Because everyone is looking for this miraculous business model. So I was asking, in the US, did they find some, did they find some business model that we can emulate uh, elsewhere? And the answer was, was no. Not yet. Uh, what Lacum and, 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 and Nawat is trying to do, as other news websites before them all over the world, is, is to, to build brands. There is a reason you, you, you read the New York Times. You know, there is an economical rationale behind it, because you cannot read everything of interest to you. That's too much. So you need to go to one brand that will you know, uh, package uh, all the uh, interesting uh, subjects for you and give them, deliver them to you in, in a way you pretty much like. Not 100%, but you pretty much like. Uh, that's what we're trying to replicate, but over the internet. And everybody else is trying to do the same, by the way. So it's, it's, it's a good evolution, is to have these this, this new institutions that are beholden to their reputation, so that, are, that will be investing in, 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 in ethical journalism, in trying to produce some, some sound uh, analysis, sound information, uh, to put some money. We have talked about um, how the, the most expensive genre in journalism is, is, is investigation. So, did you want to comment specifically uh, on that? Sorry. Yeah. Sure. That would good up again. Uh, I want to add to what Gwen said about uh, ah. good journalism, because I think it's really important that we don't lose that. And I'll give an example in Jordan. We, I mean, I think we've seen like a circle. We were witnessing at one time uh, almost no access to good journalism or good information, let's say. And then now there's everybody can write, everybody can create their own website, but the quality of journalism hasn't increased. I mean, the same good articles are being uh, republished in all the new websites, and there's a lot of rubbish that's also being published on the new websites. So, I think we, you know, I think we've come around the, the fact that there was not enough platforms. Now there's too many platforms, but the, quanti the quality of journalism has not improved in, in a good way. I mean, important stories, breakthrough stories, people can break now stories. And so uh, information is now available, but hard hitting investigative reporting that takes a lot of really good journalism and, and, and you know, just quality of time to be done hasn't really changed. So, so I think we need to give both these issues. And in fact, the bad stuffing on, on journalism is giving the internet a very bad name. And now countries uh, are putting a lot of laws and raising up very much high fi fees for things like you know, character assassination. Now they just passed a law in Jordan, 30,000 JDs, which is like about $50,000. If you is that character assassin, so you say somebody is a corrupt person or an official, and you can't prove it, you go to jail or you pay fifty thousand dollars. It's a lot of money, and it's basically to kind of uh, create these uh, legal systems to stop people from s saying things without proof. And if you don't have access to information, how can you get good proof? So it's a vicious cycle. Okay. Did you finish your point, over back? Or no. Uh, in fact, uh, thanks, Daoud, for this uh, intervention because because I, I happen to to have a different opinion on this. I, I I think that if the quality of journalism has not improved, it's not it's not because you have this wild uh, space that is internet. It's because it's a problem of a business model. It's not a problem of. On the contrary, I do believe that 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 this lowering of barriers to entry to everyone to 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 write and to make his information public is, 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 is actually very hard on, 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 on professional journalists because it keeps them on their toes. Because if, they, if, they, uh, if their work is not good enough, it's, it's, it's known in the, in the second and everybody w will know it. So and I, I would guess that on the contrary, it, it helps produce uh, better journalism. But the big question is really the business model. Okay, Fernando and Tom, uh, is it helping better journalism? And how are we filling the reporting gaps or fact-checking gaps? It's a big question, a, but it's a huge one. question, and it's a very uh, ripe one, especially in the U.S. with the massive layoffs that have happened. And hey, I understand your concerns. Um, the we need good journalism. It's not as the lesson about you know if you haven't got the journalism, it doesn't matter what platform it's on. Um, We've struggled with this, and we've you know you know pushed it. The, the report is looking at what what's going on, and really you've got to sit back and say, so we're spending more on media and communications per capita than we have before. Um, 
but less money is actually going to produce news. And that's it's because the market is the, the bundling of the uh, in comedy sort of still of us the 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 box scores in the baseball that are easy to to collect with the hard hitting news that you had to buy because you had to buy it as a newspaper it is no is not happening you get niche news um, people uh, go to the website with the box scores a lot more, and gener that generates the advertising revenue. Uh, the economics of, of newspapers are just getting worse. So you, there's no. Ma I don't. I personally am not convinced there is a magic bullet anywhere for this. The question is, where does it come from? And people have struggled to to uh, see this, see what it could be. And I, I, the obvious ones is philanthropy or greater non-profit funded journalism. And I, I think that's definitely an an element. Uh, but I think we have to look really seriously in the U.S., especially at the publicly funded uh, media. We, uh, as U.S. taxpayers, pay a buck thirty-five per capita per uh, per year on public media. Uh, our nearest OECD competitor, Canada, spends twenty; the U.K. spends sixty. Is it any wonder that there's a difference between the journalism the BBC produces? Uh, well, Thanks to Thank you very much. We'll have um, uh, and uh, the, the scope of what uh, PBS and public radio uh, can produce. Uh, and the, the other side of this is that some of this, I think, at the local level will come out of some citizen reporting. But this is not going to magically appear. Citizen reporters are not uh, wonderful journalists just because they are citizens who see a car crash. Um, we've got to think about the local anchor in institutions that we need to design in the community around maybe around libraries or around community centers um, that uh, will get funded in some way to connect people with news and i think we've just got to recognize that the, the business model we're not going to innovate our way out of this we are going to get uh, lower cost as the cost of newsprint just disappears as people stop using printing presses. But the good journalism still just costs money. Um, yeah, to to try to answer that question and also link it um, with uh, part of what the, the gentleman from South Africa mentioned before, um, when he says, uh, well, we, you know, we have all these um, outlets, all these channels, but how are we going to fill them? Um, I think we, we tend to forget um, the the economics of attention is like well you know we have that much attention span and that many people who can pay attention to the media so the fact that we increase and multiply the offer doesn't mean that people are actually going to be, be watching more because there's a, a clear limit to that and that um, limit uh, to attention also affect the amount of capital that you can put into the media it's like we cannot have um, the same amount of money to develop one channel as we have to develop 10 channels. We kind of multiply the investment in 10 times. Um, and so that takes me to, to, to the question about quality journalism. Um, I think we need to, we kind of think about quality journalism in isolation. It's uh, newspapers, um, reporters producing this uh, wonderful investigative journalism. Um, unless we are able to understand the whole dynamic of the media um, production and consumption, we won't be able to understand whether we actually improve in the quality of journalism or we're actually degrading it. And, and part of the problem is that a significant amount of revenue uh, is moving away from traditional journalistic uh, sources into other types of media many of which are online platforms. So we cannot just uh, ignore the context um, if we want to explain what happens with journalism these days. I've got one more response to Guy Berger's comments. I mean, and Guy, I think I expect you may know all this because uh, I know you're very uh, knowledgeable in all these issues. Um, but I mean, th there are some fascinating experiments in Australia with the way the Australian National Broadband Plan, National Broadband uh, Network is being developed, and in New Zealand, a basically a very different model uh, that's of massive investments around how to create connectivity in both in urban and in rural areas. Um, and you contrast those models with what's going on 
uh, in the US, which is actually a remarkably modest uh, attempt uh, at relatively low cost um, with relatively modest goals of connectivity, both urban and, to be quite frank, rural connectivity assumptions seem to are premised on 4G is good enough. Uh, and as you said yourself, 4G isn't cable broadband. Um, and I think it's, uh, the, we may have to re-examine re that in this country with the, the norms that we set, but there's a, plenty of options out there for how it can be done, as I, as I you know. Yep. Question there. One more question to Tom. Back to the issue of quality journalism. The stunning difference you mentioned between expenditure of public media in US, Britain, and um, Canada. Is it making or could it make a difference online? So the way public media or public federal spending on public media is actually 99% uh, allocated or approximately that uh, to both radio and television. 75% of that money goes to public television. Um, the uh, I personally would be very supportive of uh, broadening the the vehicles uh, for to receive that money, and I think it could get, make a massive difference online. There was a great article in the uh, New York Times a few last week, or maybe it's earlier this week, around um, topics, uh, a sort of a chat room space that become popular in in many small towns as the only place where things get discussed, and it's uh, of local gossip, and it's not particularly. Uh, invigorating or positive view, picture of the future. If you just think of what a public television entity could be in in this century, as opposed to when public media and public broadcasting was found in the last century, um, is just a, a tremendously exciting opportunity for two-way engagement uh, of citizens, engaging citizen journalists, but also supporting uh, and fact-checking what, what's found and really contributing to the de democratic process in a way that was always envisaged through, in a sort of educational way with old school public broadcasting, but could be really remade. And it's just an opportunity that I, I am, uh, you know, I'm excited about yet, as I said, with Congress, you can't get too optimistic right now with how things are going. It's entirely possible that public funding could be completely zeroed out in the super congress debates that are going on right now. And although I think that's, that may not happen, um, I would like to see much more innovation uh, and money going into online entities. OK. Any other? Back there. <coughs> Hi, <clears throat> my name is Peter Kanoy from Skylight Pictures which is a independent documentary um, producing company. Oh, and this is a question for, for all or any of the panelists. Um, we've, we're beginning an experiment in trying to help collect and develop the historic memory in Guatemala for a period of time that took place during extreme violence in Guatemala that nobody there really wants to talk about. And we're using the internet in a kind of sort of a wiki model to try to get many, many individuals to add their memories to some kind of understanding of what happened during that time period. And I'm, I'm wondering if any of you in your research have come across this type of use of, of Internet. Okay. Hmm. He wants to. I'm trying to think, and I, I I don't recall any specific case. Though, uh, yeah, um, actually, um, Colombia maybe has some 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 case of um, websites in which people can tell their experiences of, of violence and, 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 and the problems of violence that the country has gone through in recent years. I think that will be the closest thing to what uh, you, you mentioned. But uh, let me ask you, is, is this, um, um, you're recording people's memories um, on camera, or is it just like opening a space for people to come and um, 
join and express themselves and, and tell their stories or? Well, it's, it's, we're using a trigger of a documentary, we're using a trigger of a documentary film uh -huh. that, we've, that we're about to release in Guatemala, mm -hmm. which, which in test screenings really gets people to speak a lot about their experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of it is going to be, you know, hand collected from younger generation collecting the stories from the older generation mm -hmm. with a cell phone application. And some of it, you know, will be like a story corp booth in certain places where people come to add their memories and then have these curated onto a site that's a public site that can be accessed mm -hmm. by, by the general public. I wonder, Gordana, do you sort of know any of the, of any of the, because with your overview of the various media, uh, I actually don't know uh, much of uh, similar experiences, but I think it would be very interesting to debate the possible use of media in uh, in in similar experiments around uh, the country that were offline that could be now put online, and uh, uh, we would I, I would be willing to talk to you after that. There's a point here. I think uh, there are a lot of. Uh Hi, Jessica Clark, Center for Social Media and Local Lore in New America, <laughs> various other things. Um, there are a lot of different variations on this theme, like the It Gets Better campaign. Uh, people are collecting um, stories of being bullied because they're um, gay and lesbian as youth and how it got better. Um, the Holocaust Museum in Philly has a, a story booth um, where they have pe prompt people to talk about values related to tolerance. So it's definitely a, a model that's been tried in a lot of different venues. There was a lot of, uh, there were several experiments around, just around this anniversary of 9-11. You can look at futurepublicmedia.net if you want to find some. Miguel, you had the point, huh? Yeah, well, something that you could uh, look at is uh, Holman Morris, a Colombian journalist. He uh, had a documentary called Impunity, right. and he has 700 hours of, of recordings of, of victims of violence on camera which he is planning to put online on a virtual museum of, of memory. So, impunity. It was shown in New York yes, in the Human Rights Festival. Okay. A point and, there? Yeah, the, one of the granddaddies of these kinds of sites are Susan Micellis' website, aka Kurdistan, which is interactive with the Kurdish diaspora. Good. Okay, I think we're coming to the end of our time. It's been a fascinating Discussion. I thought I was kind of I was very tempted to try and reduce the discussion to to a simple single question. Um, anyway, I'll have a go at it uh, because because of the discussion that we had towards the end of the uh, the debate about whether or not um, digital media has ch has helped, uh, if you like, journalism or not. Is there a notion that new media is a dangerous thing or is it a good thing? Or I mean, how many people here think that it has really helped? journalism and it has helped democracy. Hands up those who think that it has. Very good. Hands up those who think it hasn't. I think the I positives win overwhelmingly. I, I think on that positive note, we better conclude. <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed. And, and you could... And you could watch the whole thing again, I think, in a few days or a few weeks. In, in a couple of days, I think. And uh, if you want, here are the www.soros.org or www.mediapolicy.org or fora.tv. These are the three sites. If you, if you want them in, uh, to, to make a note of them, Miguel can help you afterwards. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.